Ganga, you can start now. Okay, sir. Yes, we are live now. Yeah. Go ahead. Namaste. Good evening, Sabai Jana Lai. Thank you so much for joining in, Sabai Jana. And I would like to thank my guest speakers and our moderator, uh, Manish Samnani, sir, for his immense effort uh, for making this live conversation happen exclusively for the population of Nepal. And I'm so, 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 so grateful that we have been given this opportunity. Uh, this will mark uh, a huge impact on how we see autism and our perspective on the future uh, autism has so i hope you uh, you all will take bring uh, home uh, take along a lot of things from this live conversation and uh, firstly i would like to introduce you to our moderator mr manish samnani he is a phd scholar uh, he he has a master of occupational therapy in pediatrics uh, he graduated uh, his BOT in 2000 and he did his post-graduation and completed in pediatric OT in 2005 with a gold medal. He is the clinical director of Soch Gurgaon and manages a multidisciplinary team of 35 therapists since 10 years. He is on advisory board to InSync Hyderabad, ACE School Gurgaon, Duish Kolkata, Autism Center, Ludhiana, Zeher Chittagong and Faith Bangladesh. He has certification in sensory integration and certification in neurodevelopmental therapy and training in developmental assessment scales for Indian infants. He has served in Jamia Hamdard for graduate and postgraduate occupational therapy students. He has presented papers in conferences of EOTA and European SI Congress, that is Sensory Integration Congress. He has developed and presented parents and professionals workshops about OT in autism behavior and sensory integration in multiple cities across India and abroad. He organizes and contributes to professional development programs and short-term courses in collaboration with Adelphi University, New York, Council for SI Education, Missouri State University, Thomas Jefferson University for OT, and other professionals in India and neighboring countries. He was the autism Indian OT expert on the US-based Autism Life program. He has published three research papers in Indian Journal of Occupational Therapy and also in Sensory Integration International. Currently, he has been appointed as the Asia Regional Lead for International Normative Data Collection Project by Thomas Jefferson University and IR Sensory Integration. He is the president of Haryana chapter of All India Occupational Therapist Association and is working in collaboration with OT and other allied health professionals as guide, mentor, and supervisor, supported by his wife, Mrs. Malika Samnani, who is also an OT and PhD scholar. Thank you so much for sir for your immense effort for making this happen. And I would like you, I'd like you to pass the introduction for our guest uh, speakers. Uh, and there you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ganga. I think it was uh, quite a long <laughs> introduction for, for the moderator of the program. However, without further delay, let me welcome Dr. Grandin and uh, Dr. Stephen Shore. Uh, we all know who they are. They, they are people who do not need any sort of introduction. They are the pioneers. They are the people who have their first person accounts of experiencing and navigating autism. And they are uh, not just uh, people who have overcome uh, the life and the challenges associated, the, but they have also have developed autism as their own strength. I welcome uh, Dr. Grandin and Dr. Stephen Shore, both of you. Uh, you both of you are uh, highly uh, looked upon speakers, uh, faculty, a source of knowledge here in Indian region, in India, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, and, and around the globe, I'm, I'm very sure. Stephen has uh, visited uh, India 
couple of times now, I think uh, a dozen times already. And he has also done some specific programs with us uh, uh, where, where we have been able to meet face to face. And we have done something on expressive art side and other related uh, fields of knowledge to autism. Dr. Grandin, of course, uh, we, we welcome you again uh, with, with me at the previous program that we had with you. Let me tell you that that program was very, very successful in terms of creating a sense of uh, hope, a sense of optimism, a sense of strength in all entire community relating to autism. I had received a lot of appreciation uh, to you, to the feedback or inputs received, to the whole program and the concept as well. And I was, I'm so great, grateful to, to you to uh, be able to accept whenever we invite you, whenever we kind of uh, hope that you should be with us, you gracefully uh, accept, uh, take out your precious time. And uh, Stephen, uh, Dr. Stephen as well. Uh, so we are here one more time. And we are here because we wanted to touch base with a lot of people in Nepal as well, because uh, it's, a, it's a country which has so much of a cultural similarity with India, but yet it is still, it might still be some, something that is still to be reached out to. So uh, with, uh, with Ganga's help, we are trying to communicate with parents there. But of course, there are all kinds of parents who are welcome, who can, who can join us and put in their questions. So we welcome both of you. And if you both of, uh, both of you have any opening note or any opening message for us in India, for ne in Nepal and for any other viewers who are viewing this program. Dr. Grandin. It might still be some, something that is still to be reached out to. So uh, with, uh, with Dr. Grandin, if you would like. Okay, um, do you want me to start? Yes, yes. you start. I started last okay. time, you start this time. All right, then I'm gonna just start out introduce myself. I'm um, Temple Brandon. I am now a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I've been a research scientist and a professor now for 30 years. And I've uh, built all kinds, designed all kinds of equipment for our livestock industry. And when I was uh, four years old, I had no speech. You see, the thing about autism is when the children are very little, two years old, three years old, may not have speech, may have a lot of repetitive behavior, do not interact with people. That's the way I looked. A child can look really severe when they're extremely young. But if you do a lot of teaching that child, um, I was one of the ones that got me talking. See, autism is what's called a continuous trait. What does that mean? You can have somebody is a little bit socially awkward that had no speech delay, when they have a few of the traits, I had speech delay. And then there's some, when they're young, they've got more problems like epilepsy, but it's a true continuous trait. And you cannot tell when the child is two or three, what the outcome's gonna be. But the research shows very clearly that you've got to work with this little kid who's not talking. I don't care what the diagnosis is, little kids that are not talking, people need to work with them start playing turn-taking games. A lot of that was done with me. If the child is spin, spinning a coin, then let's take turns spinning a coin or take turns playing with a toy car. Now, a little bit older, I was taught how to wait and take turns with board games, just simple board games. Um, you've got to engage them. Other things I was taught was how to eat correctly with utensils, taught to dress myself. The worst thing you can do with little children that are not talking is to just do nothing. Let them just sit in the corner. The research is very, very clear. The younger that you start working with a nonverbal child that's not talking, the better uh, results you have. And before we went live, um, Dr. Shore was talking about the importance of giving the child a way to communicate. I can remember the frustration when I was three years old of not being able to communicate something that I wanted. And the one way you can have sign language or you can have a picture board, uh, but they've got to have a way to communicate. And you start off just teaching uh, the names of toys, names of foods. And it's very important to speak slowly to the child. My speech teacher would hold up a cup 
she'd hold up a she'd hold up a cup a coffee cup and she'd say now you say cup and she'd say cup really really slow she'd say cup very very slow and then she'd alternate and say it regular and then i was praised you know for saying it there's kind of three ways that you can have a problem with speech even though the child is not deaf can pass a hearing test when the adults talk really really fast it just sounds like blah, 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 blah. it just went into gibberish that's why it's so important to slow down or you could have i also had problems with getting my speech out it's like having a big stutter so it's really important when you're working with these little kids to work in a quiet environment and when you ask the kid to say a word give them time to respond their brain works at a slower speed. You've got to give the child time to respond. Another issue that you can have with a lot of these kids is sound sensitive. They might start screaming at the train station or some other place where there's a lot of loud noise. You know, they might not like uh, something that makes a lot of loud noise. Now, sometimes a child can tolerate a loud noise if they make the noise. Let's say it's just hammering nails into a board somewhere. So you let them do it where they control the noise or it might be a bell that hurts their ears. You let the child control the noise. Now, obviously they can't control the noise in the train station, but you give the child control. Um, he might wanna put on headphones uh, to block out the noise. Well, you want to try to encourage them to not wear the headphones, but they're there if you really need them. If you really need them, then you can put on the headphones. But there's been some children that could not tolerate a very, very noisy thing. And when they were given control of it, or then they got learned to tolerate it better. But sensory problems are real. There's also some other kids that will have visual sensitivity. They, they, um, they, they get confused if there's a lot of just visual stimuli. So oftentimes things will work better if you get them in a, in a quiet place to work with them. And so I wanna work on speech. Also wanna work on basic skills, eating, dressing, using a toilet, basic skills. Kids that will have visual often, they parents pay. and teachers um, help the kid too much. He's trying to put on his coat. He, some of these children have motor coordination problems. Uh, there's a tendency to help too much. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to just kind of stretch them to, to do new things. Now, somebody else had something to say. I, I talk about turn taking. You know, I need to let people do that. I wasn't sure if someone wanted to take a turn. Uh, now, the thing about autism is Einstein, the famous scientist, the theory of relativity, he had no speech until age three. You know, when he was a young child, he definitely was, did not have normal development. And look at what um, he accomplished. See, this is where you have a big range. And then there's some individuals that will never learn to speak. But the, some of these individuals who never learn to speak can learn to type on text messaging program, it's regular on a phone. It needs to be a tablet or a bigger phone. Learn to type. They can learn to communicate with a picture board. Um, they can learn to do simple jobs. There often is a time, there's often a problem with underestimating, you know, some of the things that they can do. Um, on the individuals that become completely verbal, like me, you will tend to have, um, uneven skills in school. Good at one subject, really bad at another subject. And this can be highly variable. When I was eight years old, um, my ability in art became apparent. And my mother always encouraged my ability in art. Um, you want to take the thing that the child is good at and build on it build on the thing they're good at. Now, I would just draw the same horse's head over and over and over again. Some other suggested drawing the entire horse, maybe draw where the horse lives. 
Where do I ride the horse to? I broaden it out. And you may have some other children that are, you know, autistic and socially awkward that might be really good at mathematics or maybe computer programming. And if they're good at these things, then um, give them more advanced math. Some of these kids are musically gifted, but in order to, to determine if a child's musically um, got musical skills, he has to be exposed to musical instruments. You know, children get interested in stuff they get exposed to. Now, when I was very young, there was a little flute that um, children played where it had little holes you had to finger. I could never learn how to play it, but at least I was given a chance to try this flute. And another kid is going to love this flute and become really good at playing it. I'm, you know, I was, I used to like to make things as children, I, as a child. I spent hours on making kites and parachutes and experimenting with them. You know, these are things to be, to encourage. And uh, when I got older, I was kind of the odd kid. And, and where I had friends was through the shared interest. You know, maybe it could be flying kites together. I know I'm thinking, uh, you know, in some uh, countries, kites are really, really popular um, hobby. And that would be an interest that the um, child with autism could, you know, do with another person. We've got to start looking at what they can do. The famous physicist, Stephen Hawking. Okay, Stephen Hawking, famous physicist. He studied black holes in outer space. He became completely crippled in an electric wheelchair. Um, uh, he he had to use a thing that where he used his eyes to control a computer cursor to write. So he wrote very slowly. But the thing that he was really good at was doing mathematics in his head. And Stephen Hawking had a really good thing to say about disability. He said, concentrate on the things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing well. So let's say if a person got their legs injured and they were in a wheelchair and the top half is good, they can work in an in a office. You know, they can do a, a job on a computer. Uh, we've got to start looking at what the person can do. There are some individuals that remain completely nonverbal. Now, I'm not that interested in the labels, whether you label them intellectual disability or autism. You have an individual that's nonverbal. Now, if he's been taught to dress himself, um, some of them can do a job. And they like doing a job where they feel that they are contributing. I heard about an adult that, was, uh, that one teacher started working with. Uh, he was running off all kinds of problems. They were making him do stupid, busy work that he knew was fake work. So they put him to work doing some real work, stacking wood. It was a job that needed to be done. And he knew the difference between real work and fake work. We got to get more of the attitude of what the person can do. And you take somebody like Stephen Hawking, and you could, you know, you can look up his videos online, and you can see he's an electric wheelchair, very, very big disability. But he did mathematics. He could think mathematics in his head. It's the one thing that that all his disability where he could barely move uh, had no effect on mathematics that he could do in his head. And now when, when individuals get older, well, I've seen people with a label of autism uh, uh, not learn how to work. Academic skills are different than work skills. And you need to start teaching work skills young like chores around the house, just uh, cleaning the house, uh, just uh, helping with the food preparation, uh, learning to do a job. It's also very good for them to learn how to do a task where somebody outside the family is, the, is in charge of that task. Like maybe helping out in the uh, marketplace. You know, you've got a vendor there that's selling uh, vegetables. So each afternoon he works on setting up the, the stand and helping them sell the vegetables where somebody else is, is the boss. Um, when I was a teenager, I worked in, I 
basically ran a horse barn. I cleaned stalls. I put the horses in and out of the barn. But that taught me working skills. I'm seeing some situations where a child may do very well academically, but hasn't learned work skills. Now, I've worked in heavy construction for 25 years, working on big food processing plants. And it was interesting to see who designs different parts of this gigantic factory. And there's two kinds of thinkers. There's visual thinkers like me. And if you watch the HBO movie, it shows how I think in pictures. Everything I think about is a picture. There's another kind of mind that does more mathematical types of engineering. And when you look at factories, they very clever equipment, like maybe a machine that packages food. That's usually made by the visual thinkers like me, not by the mathematicians. And then things like electric power systems, uh, refrigeration systems, the structure of the building so the roof doesn't fall down, that is made by the more mathematical engineers. And I was out on these very large projects, uh, supervising construction of some equipment I designed. And there were many very talented workers there that today would be on the milder end of the autism spectrum. They were maybe dyslexic with a reading problem or maybe kind of hyperactive, tension deficit about 20% of these really smart people. Uh, and we wouldn't have gotten the plant built without them. And when they were kids, um, they were the kid that didn't talk. They were the kid who couldn't read. They were the kid that's just piles of trouble. And another thing that really helped me was my good teachers, starting with my mother. She made sure I learned how to eat correctly, got my skills. I had a wonderful teacher in primary school. Then when I was older and I was not interested in studying, I got a great science teacher. And what the science teacher did is he showed me that the reason why I should study is education's a pathway to a goal. It's not just something you do to make the family happy. You do education so I can become a scientist or maybe somebody can become a doctor. I read a wonderful story in Science Magazine just last week about a lady from India in poverty, no shoes. Her dad got sick um, uh, with tuberculosis when she was five, uh, but he believed in education and he told her, grow up, become a doctor and find cures. And the next door neighbor gave her bus fare and gave her newspapers to read, which opened up a big window of the world. She is now a top vaccine scientist for COVID right now, a top vaccine scientist. And uh, it's sort of, she never took her eyes off the goal. Um, you know, this is the kind of stuff, you know, that I really like this, you know, these kind of stories. I mean, this is a real person, Nita Patel, vaccine scientist. I was reading the science behind her vaccine. It really, really looked good. Um, but it's, it, it's a big problem you have with a lot of disabilities and handicaps is the perception that gets to be too much of a handicapped mentality. Oh, well, he's too fragile. He can't do this. Um, but I want to emphasize, concentrate on the thing the kid can do. If he's good at mathematics, give him more math. Also introduce computer programming. And you can find free stuff online for teaching JavaScript, for teaching Python. Those are two of the main programs. Uh, just the recently, the Dragon spacecraft just went to the International Space Station. And if you can look those videos up online, they're very fun videos from NASA to show students. And the display screens in the space capsule run on JavaScript. That's the same thing that runs video games. And you can find lessons online on that that are free. And um, there are some kids on the autism spectrum, maybe some dyslexic kids, where they may just really be good at programming. I tried programming years ago when it was Fortran. I couldn't do it. But this is where work on the things that the uh, individual can do. Well, I hope we're going to be getting some questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Usually when I've done these talks, there's lots of things in the chat 
I'd like to have somebody ask me some questions. Sure, Temple. We have we do are receiving uh, questions. I was hoping that you would uh, complete your this thing and then I'll start. But before I take up take up the question, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Shore, if you would like to give some message, some opening opening note for parents in in this region. Yeah, I certainly I certainly will be glad to. So a lot of what Temple said, uh, I've seen that play out over and over for autistic individuals. Uh, for myself, after 18 months of typical development, I was struck with what I call the regressive autism bomb. And that happens to about 30% of us on the autism spectrum. So at 18 months, I lost functional communication, I had meltdowns, I withdrew from the environment. And in brief, I became a very autistic little kid. It was so little known about autism that it took my parents a whole year to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctor said, uh, this kid is too sick, send him to an institution. Because that was the prognosis for an autism diagnosis in the early 60s. Send them to an institution, Maybe if things go very, very well, they could do some simple job like, uh, like pushing a broom, cleaning the floor. However, my parents, fortunately for me, uh, they advocated on my behalf, just like we're seeing ever increasing numbers of parents do that in India, Nepal, and around the world. My parents recognized that I could do a lot more than just, you know, waste institution and they can the diagnosing professionals to accept me to their school a year later. So it was during that year that my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program. And this was a program that emphasized movement, music, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. And that's just today's terminology. Back then, the concept of early intervention didn't even exist. So what did my parents do? A lot of autistic people have difficulty with body to environmental relations, as described by practitioners of the Miller method, and so often worked on by occupational therapists as well. And uh, in extreme cases, uh, this is the person, for example, who may not know where their body ends and where the chair begins. In more mild cases, this is the person who is a bull in a china shop, someone who's clumsy, knocks things over, doesn't recognize their own strength. And so movement is so important uh, for people like us on the autism spectrum. Uh, communication getting into my world. So my parents desperately tried to get me to imitate them and that didn't work. Possibly due to a difference in mirror neurons, it may be difficult for autistic people to imitate, especially when young. Mm -hmm. So my parents flipped it around and they imitated me. And similarly to what Temple Grandin was talking about, you have a kid that's spinning a quarter, spinning a coin round and round. You don't just take it away but you use it as an entryway or a lever in which to develop interaction. I wasn't spinning coins at that time, but I was making sounds that I heard from in the environment. Uh, and uh, I was doing repetitive things, uh, flapping my hands and so on. And that's what my parents did. And once, I, once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment. And I believe the key is, is that you have to develop, you have to meet the autistic child where they are and develop a trusting relationship. Then you can move on. And the music that my parents did, we had music on in the house all day, all night. We moved to music, we danced to music, we did things to music. And there's something about music that speaks to autistic people and to everybody, I believe, in general. Whatever seems to scramble the speech centers of the brain in autism tends to leave the musical ones intact. And I often find that 
when I teach autistic uh, individuals music, uh, they may not be able to speak. They may not have much expressive communication, but through careful teaching, these individuals too can learn how to play the piano and learn how to play other instruments just like anybody else. And what I find really interesting are those students who are functionally uh, non-speaking, so they don't use words to communicate, but they can sing when you play a piece that they know. Sometimes they'll even play the piece and they'll sing it and they'll sound like anybody else. And I believe there is an important connection there between music and speech that can be used to help students uh, acquire verbal interaction. I have some students that I would communicate with uh, using a sing-song voice. So we'd sing back and forth to each other. If we spoke, then uh, not much interaction would, would happen at all. So with the work that my parents did, speech began to return at age four. And just like with Temple, uh, there was the emphasis on communication. Uh, fortunately for both Temple and I, uh, we did learn how to speak and we can use uh, spoken word as our, as our primary means of communication. However, we need to make sure that that autistic person has a reliable means of communication. It might be through pictures, picture exchange communication systems. It also might be through a uh, sign language, whatever it is. And even if that person requires you to speak, they will still have a reliable means of communication. And as Temple mentioned, it is so frustrating and anxiety producing when you are unable to communicate your needs or your wants. So at age four, I entered the school that initially rejected me. I got reevaluated. Instead of being considered as psychotic and ready for an institution, I got upgraded to neurotic. So things were looking better in the world. Also at age four was my first highly focused interest. My parents found me at age four, taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I would pop open the back. I would extract the motor. I'd remove some of the gears. I'd spin them around and then put it all back together again and the watch still worked and there weren't any pieces left over. So a, a couple of important points from that. Number one, my parents recognized this as an ability and they worked with that ability. Instead of looking at the closed door of disability disorder and deficit, my parents soon provided me with all kinds of other devices to take apart. And they'd also make sure I got them back together again. And I, I bring this up because it's important to recognize what are the strengths, what are the abilities of autistic individuals. We need to be asking what can the autistic person do. And keeping this in mind, maybe watch repair could be a future area of study or possibly employment. And as Temple said, we don't know how far an autistic person is going to go. So at age four, it looked like maybe I'd be a watchmaker or a watch repairman. I'd need a lot of support and communication and a lot of support living as an adult, but at least it was something I could do. And if it wasn't directly fixing watches, maybe that interest could be redirected to some sort of other repair, probably of small devices. Now, another thing that this brings out is how could I have the fine motor control to take apart a watch with a sharp knife? However, when it came to penmanship, I was a total disaster area. And something that occupational therapists work with a lot, improving penmanship. Okay. So how could I have the fine motor control to do one thing and not another? And there are some neurological reasons for that. Additionally, what this also tells us is that there is a sharp line of demarcation between ability and disability that autism brings us. Both Temple and I talk about strengths, using strengths for promoting fulfilling and productive lives. 
But at the same time, we still have to recognize the real challenges and real disabilities that can come with being autistic. Well, then on, onwards to age six, I entered regular school kindergarten. That was a social and academic catastrophe. You know what happens to children who are different in grade school? Both Temple and I have talked about being bullied. Almost everybody I know on the autism spectrum has been bullied in school. Fortunately, school systems have now begun to realize that bullying is not a developmental phase that children need to go through and things are being done about it. Academically, I was about a grade behind in most of my subjects, but I still like going to school because school had a regular schedule. School is where I could learn things. I was fascinated by all kinds of things. And my favorite activity all through grade school would be to go to the library and get all the books on whatever I was interested in, a stack of books on astronomy, then later on weather, maybe earthquakes, volcanoes, dinosaurs, whatever it was. And I'd put them all on my desk, I'd read them, I'd take notes, I'd copy diagrams, sometimes even wonder if there was more to school, such as reading in groups or doing math with other people, but I just kind of did my own thing. And I think what that translated to is the teachers didn't quite know how to reach me. But at the same time, since I wasn't a behavior problem, they just left me to my own devices. And I think in this situation, it was probably for better rather than for worse, because there was so little known about autism in those days. I remember in third grade, I had astronomy books on my day, and a teacher told me that I'd never learned how to do math. But somehow I've learned just enough math to teach statistics at the university level. Now these days I'm seeing increasing numbers of educators who would notice this type of special interest and then work with that interest, in this case, to teach mathematics. And so I'm seeing more using interests to develop as intrinsic reinforcers. So what I mean by that is let us suppose we have a grade school child who's not interested in doing math. Maybe they're not good at math, but we also find that they love to use a flight simulator on a computer. Now commonly a program, a system would be set up where we get the child to do math for 20 minutes. And if they do what they need to do for 20 minutes, then they can use the flight simulator as a reinforcer for the remaining 10 minutes of class. However, in a way that's working against the characteristics of autism as opposed to with the characteristics. Now what I would do is I'd find a way to use that flight simulator to teach mathematics, to give the reason why, why are we bothering to learn something that's kind of difficult. And in that way, mathematics now becomes, becomes intrinsically reinforcing. Yeah. And we don't, then don't have to fade away an extrinsic reinforcer. In middle and high school, you don't need to be autistic to have difficulty in middle and high school. But for me, it was actually easier because I was able to engage in my highly focused interest of music. I joined the band. Now I had a structured activity in which to mediate my interactions with others. And so often we find that when autistic individuals or even or students who aren't autistic or don't have any documented disability, they may often fall flat when it comes to academics, but you put them in a wood shop, mechanic shop, electrical uh, 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 classes on electricity or any one of these specials types of courses. And these students really shine in these areas, which is why it's important to expose students uh, to working with their hands and to being able to make things. And that gets on to employment that Temple talked about earlier. Employment, preparation for employment begins with chores around the house. Because chores around the house, whether it's making the bed, feeding the cat, taking out the trash, they tend to be cyclical in nature. You have to do them over and over. You have to achieve a certain proficiency at them. And you have to do them whether you like it or not. 
Everybody has to go to work, even on days that they don't want to go to work. And it's this regular exposure to these uh, chores that develop, go far in developing a good work ethic. Then as Temple mentioned, by middle and high school, the autistic person should have a job outside the house. And I remember at that time, I got a paper route. The paper route was a great business and miniature form that could be handled uh, by a child. And in addition to the regularity of having to do it, whether I wanted to or not, in addition to having to gain proficiency and becoming good at it, I also had to be good enough so that students, so that my customers would keep me and I wouldn't drop customers. I had to deliver the papers correctly, put them between the doors so that they wouldn't get wet whenever it rained. And in that way, that was good training for employment. Uh, later on, I got fascinated with bicycles and I did with bicycles uh, what I did with watches. I could take a bicycle apart down to the ball bearings and put that back together again, which eventually led to employment as a bicycle mechanic in high school and then later on in college. And fixing bicycles was a great way to pay for college. And I remember plastering my uh, college campus with thousands of signs advertising that I could fix your bicycle too. And I'd get all these phone calls and I'd have up to a dozen bicycles in various stages of repair in my And it was great. I could spend all day on Saturday, fix bicycles, and come out with maybe $200 at the end of the day, which was much better, much more interesting to me than doing a boring work-study job as a security guard. Now, another thing that needs to be addressed is living with other people. I wonder how my roommate felt about having all these bicycles on my side of the dorm room. It wasn't on his side of the dorm room, it was my side of the dorm room. But still, it was probably something that I shouldn't have done. And my older sister, upon finding out about it, made sure that I just got those bicycles out of the room, except when I was fixing a particular bicycle. But otherwise, they had to be stored somewhere else. So. Uh, after college, uh, or during college, my bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree, I'd written uh, three books, including an autobiography, Beyond the Wall, um, another book on self-advocacy for people on the spectrum, and also understanding autism for dummies. I'd also begun presenting uh, around the world, talking about autism, and then got a job as a professor of special education, uh, focusing mostly on issues related to autism, whether it's teaching uh, educators and other people in related fields to support autistic individuals, uh, and also researching on autism, writing books on autism. And here I am uh, giving workshops and webinars, just like I'm doing right now, talking to you. That's great to hear, sir. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, I have uh, some questions coming in. Uh, 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 Dr. Grandin, we have a question more to do with the inappropriate touching. I understand it's about inappropriate touching of uh, private parts. This is a question by Sazmun Nahar, and her uh, daughter is nine and a half. Uh, she is nonverbal. She has strong sensory needs. She may not understand uh, social stories and she does not have understanding of private parts as well. However, she would like to uh, know if what could work to teach her uh, about inappropriate touching. Um, sorry about the noise. Uh, there's a road uh, paving machine outside. I can't do anything about this noise. Um, you basically have to teach her there's a place where she can do that activity and, and in public, no. You just teach them um, you know, some very, very simple rules about that and just do it in a really calm, matter-of-fact manner. 
And I'm gonna turn my mic off because of the road paving machine. So you can hear the next question. So another question uh, is about, uh, is, is from Anna K. And uh, her question is, how to motivate children without using reinforcers? Because uh, she feels that they act like bribes or sometimes they are even, even, uh, even how to not use negative reinforcers. Uh, basically, how do we instill a sense of enthusiasm or thrill in doing household chores, on doing ADL studies and physical activities in children? Put my mic back on. Uh, give the child some choices of household activities where you could do the dishes or you could sweep the floor. Just simple choices, which give the child some control of it. Also, some activities are, are intrinsically motivating. Like for some individuals, music, they just like to do it. Um, and then there's other things, it's just work you have to do, but give some choices, that, that will help. You are gonna do chores, but we'll, you'll give you a choice of two different chores. Oh, great. Another, another question uh, uh, maybe Dr. Stephen can take up is uh, how do we tell children who are on the high functioning side or, of, or, or they are on the neurodiversity side that this thing about limitation of meeting people, going out very freely is going to go on for some time uh, now that they have already experienced the lockdown period. However, we all understand that it could be something that it would take a little more time and it is a little more uh, uh, new normal. So Nupur Tiwari's question is about how do we ch tell children, how do we explain to them that, uh, that adapting to this new normal uh, is, is, uh, is, is something that is going to last for some time? Well, for the person who is uh, neurodiverse or someone who is a uh, um, we sometimes call the high functioning part of autism uh, now described as <clears throat> autism spectrum disorder to needing level one supports. It means we have to explain to them in a way that they can understand uh, what a virus is. And in doing so, why we need to keep safe from viruses and how some how vaccines have been developed for some viruses, uh, which is why we don't have them anymore. But for the COVID-19 virus, we are well on our way to developing a vaccine. And teaching that uh, individual uh, to do their own research online uh, about the status uh, of the COVID-19. Fortunately, it looks like that there's a couple of companies who are well on the way to developing that vaccine. And that until that vaccine, uh, makes its way to the public, uh, we are going to have to uh, uh, maintain the current lifestyle. Now that said, uh, we can still maintain contact with other people. We can still engage in activities as long as we do it in a safe manner. For now, most contact is going to be electronic, just like we're doing right now. The COVID-19 pandemic is probably part, a good part of the reason why we are not in Nepal talking to hundreds of people in an audience face to face. Uh, but eventually we will get there. So for the autistic child, uh, actually for everybody, we have to be much more intentional and much more mindful of making sure that we maintain contact with people who are important in our lives. And we have all kinds of electronic ways to do that, instant message, Facebook, Zoom, uh, whatever it might be. So that way we can still remain in contact. Uh, Dr. Grandin, one of, one of the very uh, interesting questions is about how do we make children with autism to think and work without using prompts or stimulus? Well, when I was a little kid, things like uh, using utensils properly at the table to eat, uh, that um, you know, was just sort of expected. Again, give them some limited choice. It's important for the child to have uh, some control over their environment. They're gonna have to do work, but give them, a, especially when they're first learning, 
some choice of the work <clears throat> that they have to do. I, I think that's a very important thing. The other big problem I see, regardless of a person's ability, is <clears throat> too much of a tendency to overprotect. Well, he has a hard time putting on his coat, so we'll just put it on him for him. I you know that that's some of the things I would do. Sure. Uh, I, Dr. Grani, this question is uh, especially for you uh, by Pragya Pradhan, and she uh, ask, she's asking, hi, Dr. Grandin, as an autistic individual, which phase of your life did you find the most challenging? Childhood, adolescence, or adulthood? Adolescence was the worst part of my life. I actually had a um, very, very good speech uh, teacher when I was very young, uh, primary school, up to age 14, that was oh, good. Uh, high school, bullying, teasing, worst part of my life. And I, for about three years, I did not study. I basically ran a horse barn, took care of the horses. Nine stalls I cleaned every day, put them in and out of the barn. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was where there was a shared interest, riding horses, building electronic devices. Those were shared uh, interests. You know, for Stephen, it was music. You see, that's an activity that you can do with other people. But one thing I learned that from that horse barn is I learned how to work. And in about a, one semester, I made up a lot of the academics I had not done, but I had learned working skills during that time. Every day, nine stalls, clean them, bed them, feed the horses bring them into the barn, let them out of the barn. I was in charge of the horse barn. And when I look back on that, I'm realizing I'd learned important work skills from that. And I was proud of the fact that I was responsible for the care of those horses. And that was that has intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. that they would trust me to take care of those animals. And they also had a small dairy and I would help out with milking the cows. And this also got me interested in the livestock industry. This gets back to exposure. You know, if Stephen hadn't been exposed to that watch when he was a child, and they actually then let him do it carefully with a knife, he might not have gotten interested in mechanical things and showed the ability to do mechanical things. Sure. Uh, Dr. Stephen, uh, there's a question by Lalita Prasai, and uh, she's asking that is it is it possible or is it true that we can teach academics to all our children with autism? Um, we can teach academics to children with autism. And however, as Temple mentioned, autism is a continuous type of situation. So there are some individuals on the autism spectrum that can go far beyond typical people in terms of academics, in terms of research, mathematics, whatever it might be. There are other individuals on the autism spectrum where we will be challenged to teach simple mathematics, uh, reading, or helping them put on their clothes. So it depends on the individual just like people who aren't autistic, we have a range of abilities and likewise with autism. Sure. Uh, a question by Dana uh, Kepna Zarova is about how to find a hobby for an autistic child. Uh, her son is nine years old, uh, but we, ha we haven't figured out what he likes, what he's good at and might be his favorite hobby. He likes puzzles, for example, but not that much as well. Well, it gets back to exposure. I mean, I like to play with kites when I was a child. Kites were one of my favorite things. Now, if I'd never didn't know what a kite was or had never been exposed to a kite, I would not have gotten interested in them. You know, I was exposed to the little flute. That did not work for me. You see, this is where one person might be uh, like the kites. Somebody else is going to like the music. Art was my thing. I was good at art. And oh, I got to show you some of my drawings. This is some of the drawings of some of my livestock facilities right here in my book, Thinking in Pictures. And 
And when I showed people my drawings, I got respect. So the artwork that I was doing at eight years old, nine years old, eventually turned into doing engineering drawings for major big companies in the US. You know, I have worked for some of the largest food companies in the US. I think that's doing really well for a person who they originally thought had an intellectual disability, was mentally retarded, and wasn't going to amount to anything. But mother always encouraged that drawing skill. And I was always encouraged to do more different kinds of drawings and not just the same horse's head over and over again. So you got to expose them to different things to find out what they like. Uh, too many kids today I'm saying aren't doing enough. They're getting, they're getting addicted to video games and ending up just playing video games all day and not doing anything else. And I've heard of three cases, these were teenage and young adult boys that um, were addicted to video games and they introduced them to car mechanics and they slowly weaned them off the video games and they became car mechanics. Um, but somebody had to expose them to that. You see, this gets into, you know, trying a bunch of stuff. Then you find out what you might like to do for a hobby. Sure. I have two questions from two uh, different parents. Uh, I understand they are both from Nepal and I think this will completely relate to what you opened up uh, the opening things that you shared with us. Swati Yogesh Devangan and uh, uh, another parent, uh, Alihis Bhardwaj, have uh, talked about their children who are three and five, respectively. And they both have said that they can't understand much. They don't speak much. And they are, they are trying to understand from us. Uh, how, what do we do to ensure that they understand and follow commands? Well, first of all, you need to just work with them. You've got to work with these kids. And one of the ways to engage them is a little turn-taking game. Take something that the child's playing with and, and start taking turns. Now, the thing I have found in working with these very young children, you know, get some grandmother volunteers in the neighborhood to come in and work with these kids. And what I've observed is some teachers have a, they just have the ability to work with these kids and to start teaching speech. And there's other people that do not. You do not need a fancy university degree to work with these kids. And older grandmothers that have worked with a lot of grandchildren can often get these children engaged in a little game. And then let's learn the word for the toy, whether it's a coin or it's a toy truck, you know, or a little uh, figurine of an animal, whatever the thing is, uh, and start learning words for food. And, and, and just start engaging them. Maybe teach them a little sign language or you teach them to point to it on a picture board. But you just work on getting them engaged. You know, there's a lot of people who get a master's degree to work with uh, three-year-olds. Um, but I have observed some teachers have the ability to kind of draw these kids out and work with them. And I would just ask for grandmother volunteers in the community to work with these little kids. Now I have a book called The Way I See It. It's my most basic autism book, The Way I See It. It is available in electronic book. And I have chapters there in working with little kids. And you have permission to translate some of those chapters into your language, which would help the, the grandmothers. But you've just got to use the resources you have in the neighborhood. Sure. Uh, uh, Ganga, if you have any questions coming in to you uh, from parents of Nepal, please do put up. Well, there's no other questions on the chat. Yeah, uh, Temple, we are receiving uh, questions on the uh, on our Facebook page page where this is being broadcasted. Okay. And yeah. we are collecting the question from there, and then we are putting uh, putting it verbally okay. across right. to you. Uh, so uh, there's this question uh, from Dr. Sunita Maleku. Uh, she says, Dr. Grandin and Dr. Stephen, I have a son 15 years old. I've been trying to figure out how I can help my son with his verbal stimming, which inhibits him from being aware of his social environment and listen to people around him. 
Well, first of all, I need to know more about this 15 year old. Is he verbal? I, I kind of, so then I know where to start working with him. Is he nonverbal? Can he dress himself? Um, you know, for a fully verbal person on stimming, and I used to do it, one of the reasons they do it is it's calming. And I was given some times that I could do it. And then you have some other times, like maybe family dinner at the dinner table, then you don't do it. And then um, when we would go to family gatherings when I was that age, there was another room where I could go off and, and do stuff or run around, run up and down the stairs in the apartment building. It's one of the things I like to do. But the big problem is I'm trying to solve some of the behavior problems of some of these individuals is I don't have enough information. You gave me his age. You know, that's really important. But I get questions sent to me by email all the time. Ma'am, uh, he is verbal. He is verbal. He is verbal. And, and how is he doing in school? Uh, he's doing good. And uh, also uh, her, his mother says that he is uh, very interested in drawing clay creation for toilet in particular. Uh, so she wants to know how can I make best use of his uh, particular interest about toilets? Well, there's different kinds of drawing. I showed you engineering type of drawings. That's called drafting. A lot of that's done by on computers now, or you have artistic drawing. I know a lady with autism, she makes the most fabulous uh, pictures of animals. Well, people will pay several hundred dollars for those pictures. So you, I'd have to look at the drawing. Um, I can't judge you know, the quality of math and programming, but drawing I can. And I look at some of these drawings and I go, wow, He's got art talent. He could uh, do commissions because the way I used to sell jobs when you're weird, when I went in for an interview, I would take the drawings I showed you there in the book, you know, have print them out, lay them out on the table, show photographs of jobs. I would simply show my work off. And if his drawings are really good, you could show his drawings to people and they'll pay for drawings. Like make a drawing of my house. Um, there's a, there's a um, um, lady named Jessie Park, and she's quite severely autistic, and she makes beautiful paintings of people's houses and decorates them in bright colors and frames them and sells them like almost $1,000. Uh, now, you probably won't get that in Nepal, but, you know, people will pay for art. Um, and the thing that you have to learn is, even with Jessie Park, she has to do the picture of the house that she's commissioned to do. And then she can color it any way she wants. If you're going to get a Jesse Park painting, your house is going to be all kinds of bright colors. But they do have to, she does have to make a drawing of their house. Start learning how to do some artwork on commission. Um, that's how I started. When I was in high school, I had a little sign painting business. Well, now signs are all done electronically, but I would make signs like for businesses. The first sign I ever made was for a place that um, that uh, cut ladies' hair, and I I made a sign for her business, and I had to make a sign that they would want, and I don't think they would have liked spaceships on the sign, so I put a picture of a lady with a nice hairdo on it, because that's something that they would want, um, so I'd work on developing a drawing talent. Um, and hopefully, and I haven't seen his art, so I take something they're good at. I developed my, my ability in art into um, industrial design. There's kind of two parts of engineering. There's a more artistic part of engineering, that's industrial design. And then you've got the more mathematical part. Remember, I've talked about the food plants. Boilers and refrigeration, it's more mathematical. Um, packaging machine. The, look inside your printer. You got a big fancy printer, look inside all the mechanism that feeds the paper. That's stuff that a visual thinker or someone like Steve would be good at design. So you got to kind of uh, visualize. I'm a visualizer, so I'm visualizing, you know, where the, where this person, you know, could do something. And then when it comes to the stimming, you have some places where you can do it because it does calm you down. And then some other places you absolutely don't do it. You're doing, you're trying to land a job. That's when you don't do it. Now maybe you can run out in the parking lot after you've got the contract signed. And then you stim in your car. 
Oh, that brings up driving. All right. If I hadn't learned to drive, I would not have had a career uh, with the livestock industry designing things. Um, there's problems with multitasking in autism. Multitasking is difficult. So for driving, I drove 400 kilometers on dirt roads before I went into traffic. It's gonna take longer to learn. You see, what you do is you practice and practice driving in a very safe place, like maybe a big parking lot at a stadium when nobody is there. Now with COVID, the stadiums are shut down. So you've got this big parking lot at a stadium and you start practicing there, back roads, and, and maybe 20 minutes a day practice, maybe a month of that, and then very carefully start to go into traffic. But uh, driving was essential for my career. Or maybe it's driving a motorcycle or a motorbike. Again, do the same thing with it. Let's, if it's a motorbike, let's learn to just ride a bike first. Let's just start with a regular bike one that Stephen would have been repairing in his dorm room. And then we get a small motorcycle and we practice maybe on some dirt where if you fall off, it's not gonna wreck you or the motorcycle. You don't know, just work into it slowly. I, I actually have, uh, sorry, Stephen, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Temple is uh, absolutely right about that. Uh, um, I was weird too when I was a kid. I probably still am weird. And I remember my first formal job where I got a paycheck at the end of every two weeks was working in a noisy restaurant cleaning tables. And that was just a basket full of sensory violations. I knew it wasn't going to work for much longer. And it made me realize that I needed to do something uh, that I was interested in and that I could moderate my sensory input. And there were the bicycles. So I got on my bicycle that I built from the ground up and I made the rounds. I rode my bicycle to all the shops in the area. There were about a dozen of them. I'd go into the shop, I'd locate the manager, and then I would nerd into my bicycle with the manager and stop talking bicycle geekery with the manager. After a period of time, I'd ask him for a job. It took about 11 times, but on the 12th time, I did get the job. And what I realized now, what I did was using the portfolio method of showing my work to the person who has the power to hire, getting that person interested in my work. And then after they were interested, asking for the job. And what also is good about that is that it short circuits all of this hidden curriculum and unspoken rules of doing a good interview. Interviewing for a job is one of the most social things anybody can do, except perhaps dating. And what do you have to do? You essentially have to get the interviewer to like you. You have to know the type of eye contact uh, and all kinds of nonverbal communication, which us autistic people can learn. We can learn all that stuff. How many times do you pump somebody's hand? Three times when you shake their hand. Everybody does that. However, autistic people need to learn that. We can learn it, it's easy. However, if we're focused on how many times do I pump the person's hand? How much eye contact do I make? What do I do when I sit across from them? Do I sit directly 180 degrees across from them? Or do I turn the chair slightly to the side and be less, uh, confrontational in nature, we can learn all that. However, if we're thinking about all of this, how much is left to focus on the job? So there was no eye contact with the manager. We were looking at my bicycle. I didn't have to shake his hand because we were focused on the bicycle. Right. By the time I asked him for a job, he knew I knew my way around a bike. I just put my drawings out on the table. I would lay my drawings out on the table just like it was shown in the movie, pull out photographs because I did my stuff that was pre-electronic. Now they might be on a, on a tablet or a computer. Show them photographs. I had written articles for our industry magazines. I had copies of the articles I gave them. I just took the portfolio and laid it out on the table. I call that the 30 second wow. And they go, wow. 
I, I sold a uh, Cargill, one of the biggest food companies in the world, I, I, by sending the uh, head of Cargill a portfolio. That's how I sold jobs, selling the work. Same thing that Stephen was doing with the bikes. I, I have a question that you would would be able to uh, would be have your own personal experience for sure. This is a question from Farman Parvez, and she's asking about her adolescent son who is not very happy about being a part of a social gathering. So her question is about how do we what do we do to make him comfortable to be a part of? Well, a okay. Gathering? First of all, I need to know his age. This is really important. An adolescent, right? adolescent, a five-year-old here, or a teenager, or an adult. Teenager. 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 Um, it started when I was little. I, in our neighborhood, I, all the children, when they got to be seven and eight years old, when the parents had a party, we put our good clothes on, we greet the guests. Now, it's, I lived where it was cold in the wintertime. So you take the guests' coats, and then we, we, we acted like a little caterers and served the food. And that taught social skills. When I was a teenager, um, yeah, you had, to sit, the, you had to sit at the table for a while. You had to shake hands with a few people, and then I was allowed to leave. Didn't have to be there for the whole time. And usually what would happen is I might find my grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. He worked, and he worked with a person on the autopilot um, who probably had autism. So all during World War II, planes were guided by a device where the original design was probably made by a person with autism. And grandfather didn't, I think he was a little bit autistic too. He did not like the gatherings. So when we went to Granny's for my grandmother's for you know the holiday, I would after we I had to sit at the table for 20 minutes and socialize. That was the rule. But then I would go in the other room. And grandfather was there and we'd talk science. I used to ask him why is the sky blue, and he'd explain it. And and, and was, he did not really like the parties either. And I find lots of times that I find. Um, somebody at a party I can talk to. Another problem I ha have is auditory processing. If it's a noisy environment, I cannot hear conversation. I, I don't really like a noisy restaurant because it's not very fun uh, to be at a restaurant and I cannot hear the conversation. As soon as there's background noise, I'm functionally deaf. So that's another reason why, you know, it's not fun. I'd rather get off and find one person where we can talk about something we're interested in. You know, so think the thing on that, he's 15 years old, he's an adolescent, that you gotta make an appearance there at least and be polite. And then maybe you can retreat off, um, you know, with one or two people, um, but just totally stay in your room. No, I was never allowed to just become a person who stayed in the room all the time. We call that a recluse, person who just stays in the room all the time. No, I had to get down there and mingle with the guests and uh, make an appearance. You know, sometimes you just got to do some stuff you don't really want to do. But you don't have to do it for five hours. But at least make an appearance. That's how it was handled with me. But when I was a young child, being these uh, part, my brother had to do it too, and he's not autistic. He had to be a little party host when he was seven with his good suit on. And he said it helped him in his job. He's a banker. He's just retired now from banking, vice president of a bank. And he said that those parties where he had to be that host uh, helped him socially. And he's, uh, he's not autistic. And he did not like the parties. He hated them. But he realized that they, uh, they helped him talking to older men. And that's how he became a bank vice president. Uh, thank yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, sir, and uh, Temple Ma'am for um, actually mentioning driving. Uh, one of my clients, he was very excited uh, to see people ride a bicycle, and he 
he got into a bicycle just once with his mother's help. He enjoyed it, but then he did not go into that bicycle again. He would just not like to ride it again. But why is it so? Uh, well, is it some kind of vestibular problem or? Well, uh, there is a balance problem. I was slow to learn to ride a bike. And one of the, you know, what motivated me to ride a bike? All the kids in our neighborhood were going to go on a t bike tour and they were gonna to go to the Coca-Cola bottling plant. And I couldn't go because I didn't know how to ride a bike. Mother did not take me there. She said, now you're gonna learn how to ride a bike. So we got on the soft grass and I did fall off a bunch of times and then I learned to ride a bike. So I think some of this in the beginning is uh, uh, there are some coordination problems sometimes in autism. And, and then once I learned to ride a bike, I was just fine. So, you know, you've got to, you got to move in a bike. It's going to tip over if you don't keep, you can't be still in it. Um, but I'll never forget that. And, you know, some moms would say, oh, well, I'll just take the car and take you to the Coca-Cola bottling plant. To this day, I've never been in the Coca-Cola bottling plant. I've been in a beer factory, a whole bunch of those, in the wine factory, but not a Coca-Cola bottling factory. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So we have one more question uh, that uh, the parent says that I always thought it would be very difficult to teach driving as it needs social awareness, social etiquettes. What would be your opinion on this? You just learn the rules. Stop signs mean stop. Speed limits so you can go a little bit over and the police can measure that. Mm -hmm. uh, I. You wear your seat belts and then there's rules. Like if you come to a four way stop, which car goes first? Our driving book has all those rules. I don't know what they, how in your country, how they, how they do it, but there's rules for who goes first at a four way stop. Yeah. The, no, that was not my problem in driving. The problem with driving for me was multitasking. And that's why I had to spend so much more time just driving a car on a dirt road. So it's called motor memory. When you learn something in motor memory, you no longer have to think about it, how to steer, how to do the accelerator, how to do the brake. I could just do it automatically. And then when that gets into motor memory, then you carefully start to do traffic. And, and there's just rules. When I was a very young child, I was playing outside. It was, I was taught before you cross the street, you look both ways so you won't get hit by a car. Um, it isn't, yes. I never viewed driving as a social activity. It's just, you know. So rules, you gotta very, understand the rules. Yeah, very good instruction. Uh, you know, even the thing that our Department of Motor Vehicles puts out a nice little book uh, with all the rules in it. Yeah, I so, agree with uh, Temple in that um, driving is very rule based. And I can only speak for the United States, um, yeah, I, uh, but other countries, I, I, I would say so as well. Uh, and also begin with riding a bicycle. Yes. You can begin yes. With riding a bicycle, get used to following the rules of the road. Um, also taking mm -hmm. that, taking that um, adolescent, that, that child with you when you drive and talk about what you're doing. Oh, I yep. see a six-sided red stop sign. This means I need to stop. Even if yep. there's no cars coming from another direction, the rule says you stop, you look yep. both ways, and then when it's safe, you continue. When I see a yellow light, the yellow light tells me that it's about to turn red and I have to stop. Even though it's not red yet, even though people tend to just gun the engine and try to get through before it turns red, the safest thing to do is to stop. And then when it turns green, even after it turns green, you still look both ways at an intersection to make sure that somebody has not run a red light and that it's safe to go. And you can talk about driving strategies when you're walking and what a car is doing and what do they need to do and noting when someone makes a mistake, for example. Yep. So that way you start the conversation of driving before you start practicing driving. Yes, and I would agree with that. Thank I you, sir. Agree with that. 
uh, and also there are a lot of questions regarding um, children not able to uh, focus on what their parent is uh, saying to them or whatever they are asking them when calling their name as well uh, and about not speaking uh, till like four years of age. So what would you like to say to those parents, ma'am? Like, Okay, they, they first of all, with any of the speaking, a lot of these children, their brain is slow processor. You know how a phone can be really slow, download a web page. Their brain is sort of like a phone with bad service. So when you're asking, let's say a partially verbal or even fully verbal young child to respond, give them time, give them time to respond. They're like that phone with a very bad surface. And if you get in there and you get in their face, then they freeze. Same way the computer can freeze and crash. That sort of happens uh, with their, uh, so give them time to respond. Um, also, if they're in a noisy environment, it's gonna be more difficult for them to respond. It would be really good to try on working on some of these things, like uh, try to find a quiet place to do it. Because when there's a lot of noise, it's like the noisy restaurant, uh, even today, a noisy restaurant, I can't hear, it's not very fun for me. And now I'm polite and I sit there and not hear 90% of the conversation in a really noisy restaurant that's got music playing. Um, you know, those are just a few things, you know, a few things that you can do. Uh, the other thing with all these really young kids, I want to do activities involving taking turns, maybe a board game, but you also have to take turns like you're at the market and there's a line to pay and you have to wait in line and take your turn. You can, cannot just go to the front of the line. That's, a, that's another thing of turn taking. It's one of the reasons why I was young. There was so much emphasis on learning how to wait and take turns because it also helps reduce impulse control. And there's so many ways to learn how to take turns. So whether it's waiting in line at a cashier or whether it's playing a board game. And many board games have also been uh, uh, ported over to the computer. So you can play Monopoly and other board games on the computer but still you have to wait your turn. And I that recommend even when driving. The, I recommend if you do this on a computer, uh, let's, it'd be better that it be a tablet or a telephone because I want that physical device passed back and forth. So you're doing it on a, the, the game right. maybe on a, on a mobile phone where mm -hmm. you have to pass that phone back and forth. That would, I'd rather do it that way than electronically pass it back and forth, especially with the really young children. Any other questions? Ganga, any other questions or can we conclude? Ganga? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and uh, how, uh, what should I do uh, to both of uh, our speakers? Uh, in your long journey in the world of autism, what is your perspective on individuals who are both deaf and on the spectrum? Uh, this is from a school psychologist uh, and her team works with deaf children. Uh, so she has found that in neurotypical deaf children who do not have language access at home, they're present with language deprivation. This, uh, the similarity I often see in these kids and deaf autistics are that both are visual learners and think in pictures. Well, they're gonna, if you're, if you, if you're deaf, you're, you're gonna live in a world of vision. But one of the things that's been learned about sign language is sign language is actually processed in the brain, in the language parts of the brain. Now, I certainly hope they're learning sign language. Uh, <clears throat> and again, work on, on, as Stephen Hawking said, concentrate on the things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing well. So there's a lot of things they might be you know, really good at doing well, but they've got to have a way to communicate. And I'm going to assume that they're teaching them sign language. Now, the problem is, is the rest of the community doesn't know sign language. There's also um, some of the deaf people can learn 
know, can learn to, uh, you know, type so they can type on a computer and communicate with, or they can type on a, on a mobile phone and then pass the mobile phone to somebody. I, I did that with a deaf person. I went to a big corporation uh, for a disability talk and we had dinner and we took my phone out and we didn't send the texts, but we just used the text messaging program. It's in the phone and we're passing the phone back and forth, typing on the text messaging because I don't know sign language. And we were laughing and having a really good time just using the standard text messaging software that's on a mobile phone. So I would encourage that sort of communication because they can do that with anybody on a phone that, mo that most people have. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So just, just like the uh, deaf person who is not autistic, yeah. uh, you will teach other means of communication. So you will do the same for the autistic individual. And since we tend to be visually based, not all of us are visually based, no, but right. many of us are, uh, then uh, communicating, well, that's all you have is visual means. And by texting and uh, other means of communication, that, that should work out. Well, and if you're just there, like we were having dinner, we didn't actually send the texts. We just were having fun passing the, the, the mobile phone back and forth and type on it. And I'd give it to him. He'd type on it, give it to me. So if that's a funny joke, I'd type on it, give it to him. And, and then if you're not together, then you send the texts, obviously. But I like to look at, at things that we, resources we have in the neighborhood, like mobile phones, you know, as a way to communicate with text. Okay. Are there any questions, Ganga, or? Uh, sir, uh, what, what do we have to say about stimming, like every kind of stimming, verbal stimming or uh, echolalia and uh, uh, fascination with spinning objects, uh, stimming in general? Is it a sensory oh, issue or is it a behavioral issue? Well, let's just separate things out. Echolalia is not necessarily mm -hmm. stimming. Let me talk about how the brain handles. There's three ways that language can be not work. I don't hear it quickly, properly. When the, when the adults talked fast, I went blah, 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 blah. That's called auditory processing. And you can have that problem even though you're not deaf. Then there's expressive speech. Couldn't get it out. Now the child that's echolalic might be repeating a TV show or a movie script and saying it very clearly, but he doesn't know what it means. So what you need to do with an echolalic kid is to take some of those phrases and sentences from that movie and work it into the real world. He's got to learn language has meaning. <clears throat> now there's other kinds of stems, uh, verbal sounds that can be extremely distracting. Uh, you know, I think some of the best thing to do with stimming is kind of have, well, you got a place where you can do it and some places that we try not to do it. Um, and then some of the most distracting stims are verbal stims where they make some kind of sound. Um, but uh, the other thing is I always I'm trying to find something that this person's interested in that I can expand. There was a, a boy that liked to rip paper. So his mom started having him make art out of ripped paper. And he's Grant Monnier, the eco artist, the eco artist, he does beautiful work. And, and she took his yes. ripping paper and turned it into something useful and he does beautiful art now. And he sells it for hundreds of dollars. Yeah, Temple is absolutely right. And that is, uh, you have to. Okay, Steve, you're not, you're not broadcasting. Oh. He's as a vocational actor. Uh, is, there, is there no sound? Yeah, you're okay now, though, but you froze. Oh, okay. The signal um, was, was not working. Okay. 
Uh, so Temple, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, stimming. Uh, that is one, uh, is there a way to turn this activity into something that's productive, just like what Grant does? I know who Grant is, I've seen the work that he does. It's absolutely great with his origami paper folding type of activity. Uh, with other stims, such as maybe verbal stims or flapping one's hands, um, what we can think of those stims are as uh, th they are actually self-regulatory be behaviors. And the person is either over anxious or maybe they're falling asleep and they're trying to get their brain uh, to regulate to an optimal level so that we can pay attention. Uh, however, some stims may be disruptive in a given situation. So if I'm in a classroom and I have a student who's flapping their hands and if it's disruptive, what I might do is I might walk over to that student and give them a therapy squeeze ball and say, here, squeeze this. Because this is a need that needs to be fulfilled and it will be fulfilled uh, whether you like it or not. So what I've done is I've redirected something that's a bit more disruptive in a community setting, a classroom in this case, and I've replaced it with something less disruptive, such as squeezing a ball. Well, and you go to these big trade shows and every commercial company has little squeeze, uh, uh, squeeze animals uh, they give out if it's livestock. I even have a squeeze oil field equipment vehicle. I have it on my shelf. That was the most unique therapy ball there was. I, so every industry, doesn't matter whether it was the oil field industry or the cattle industry or the pig industry, they give out, they, I went to one for doctors and they had brains as squeeze balls, little rubber oh, yeah. brains giving out. And, and so they're passing these things out at trade shows for every single field. So yeah, you could just have that in your hand. We exactly. have all kinds of uh, little squeeze balls of cows and pigs in our department that we, we got them at trade shows now. We haven't been to any trade shows now since March because of COVID, but they were giving them out at job recruitment fairs. Yeah. Thank you so much for so such an interesting and uh, uh, insightful uh, answers from all of you. Ganga, would you like to? Thank you so much, Dr. Yes. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Sina. Thank you, Dr. Manish. I am super glad that you guys connect down to Nikki. Her signal is failing. She may yeah. need to turn. I still a lot of queries unanswered, but still, whichever uh, questions, which. Thank you so much, sir. Thank I am so very, much. very, very grateful. Thank you so much, Dr. Grandin. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Tifshore. And I'm so grateful to all of you to be able to come on the on this program and give us time yet again. Uh, it was indeed uh, uh, very wonderful. Well, well thank you pleasure. very much for having us. It was my pleasure, and I look forward to when it becomes safe to meet in person. Absolutely. Yeah. I look forward Absolutely, to that too when we get sir. the vaccine. It would be an honor. Thank no, you. No, it's been really good talking to everybody. And we just got to start working on what we got to start looking at what's something that this um, individual can do. That That's right. It. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yes, of course. That's the key. That's the key. So, yes. okay, and bye, everyone. Okay, bye. 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 I'm going to sign bye. off. Bye. Bye. Yes, we sign off. All right, I'm going to leave the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Good night. <laughs> I mean, it's night. Hi, Stephen. Yeah, hi, hi, Manish. I should stop the recording first. Oh, yeah. I, I, I stopped the recording and I'm also going to stop for the